Okay, what I'm going to do now is to move on to uh, the uh, second part. As the advert says, this is the science part. Okay. Uh, cognitive science, things which can happen to stop um, meetings operating effectively. The Quaker business method uh, approach actually manages to mitigate many of these. Okay. That's the plan. Cognitive science, uh, which I've been teaching and studying and doing research in now for uh, some decades, uh, combines artificial intelligence, psychology, uh, linguistics, um, is applied into education and also used in anthropology uh, in order to explain human activity, human cognition, human thinking. Uh, it's a science of how humans process information. Okay. Um, and it ranges looking at phenomena at timescales from sub-seconds down to, say, 100 milliseconds, all the way through to what humans do, up to, say, a decade. So the phenomena which cognitive study, scientists may study may actually take a decade to develop, such as expertise. But what underpins all of these ideas is the fact that we're receiving, storing and retrieving, trans, uh, forming and transmitting information. So cognitive scientists basically break down all human activity into things which do these basic forms of information processes over different time scales. I think uh, ideas about all of the ones listed here, both in black and, and gray, can be used to try and uh, identify hurdles to making good decisions, uh, solving problems, but also potentially provide at least partial explanations for why the business method might work. What I'll focus on is memory, psychological biases, problem solving, and social dynamics. Uh, what I'm going to do is, for each one of these processes, I'm going to uh, think uh, to what extent there may be uh, things uh, in the Quaker Business Toolkit which will counter the problems that arise due to the way that we just think and behave, or they may ex uh, exacerbate uh, those things, okay? uh, or, or both. So again, this is a systematic decomposition again. So memory, there's lots of aspects of memory. We could even have a, a short course on a memory. Um, uh, so I'll keep it short and just pick on two parts. Okay? So um, primacy and recency effects, basically, let's imagine a meeting. Okay? And ideas are being presented over time uh, within the meeting. Okay? Then which ideas are likely to be remembered if you were to ask people after the meeting what ideas were presented? And this is a well-established phenomenon that uh, the uh, primacy effect, things which are presented early on are remembered, uh, things which are presented late on are uh, remembered, and all the stuff in the middle is forgotten. Okay? And so there's this natural process that distorts uh, the information which we have available and which we might use to make a good decision. Right? So do, does the methods... Uh, Quaker business methods actually um, are trying to uh, work against this in some way. Uh, there's very thorough um, accounts of uh, the, na uh, the way that we remember things uh, in cognitive science. Okay? And so uh, I think we're all used to the idea of um, one idea is sort of associated with another idea in mind. So if I say red and uh, emergency vehicle, that's likely to cue fire engine for you. Or if I say red and fruit, you might say strawberry or, or apple. But few of you would say jumbo jet as the association. So, so things are disconnected. Right? And so what we can imagine is that supposing you know, you've got this complex network of experience and ideas and you have a solution in your mind to a particular problem. Right? And you're sat in a meeting and uh, uh, somebody uh, uh, proposes an idea uh, here. Um, and so this, all of this network sort of represents your past experience and ideas. Okay? And so what's going to happen is there are certain links, certain ideas which are tightly linked and other ones which are more weakly associated and others which are completely disconnected. Right. And here we have a train of thought of recalling your memories to get an idea uh, as an output from a particular input. And of course, as we're going along this path, uh, what might happen is certain uh, ideas which are triggered by side thoughts which we've had 
uh, they contribute to this particular output. And so the more ideas that people contribute, the stronger you focus on this one solution. Well, what about all these other great ideas down here? How do we access them? What I've done is to take these ideas and say, okay, uh, in terms of silence, does that help or not? Well, maybe silence would actually help because it allows people not to be captured by the ideas that people are just throwing in. And so you can sit in silence and then some other idea might just pop, naturally pop up because it's not in competition. Okay? So that's a positive. But the primacy and recency effects um, uh, mean then that uh, the longer the wait, perhaps, then uh, the more likely you are to uh, forget things which are early on, especially the clerk. Uh, the clerk is given the explicit, explicit role of trying to think about writing a minute. Okay? And so they are rehearsing and keeping alive previous ideas and trying to integrate them. So maybe the clerk's role uh, keeps alive some of the ideas in the middle which uh, would have otherwise been lost. Right? Uh, being open-minded uh, clearly is, even though someone else has um, said something, You've got it in the back of your mind, no, I must think something else. I must bring new ideas to the table, and it's fine and good to do so. That mitigates against some of the problems of limited memory. Having pre-meetings, of course, could explore ideas more widely, but bring just one idea or two ideas to the table, which then everybody then fixates on. And the corporate values is a way of stepping back from the ideas which are being considered and take a fresh look from a different perspective. That may be a beneficial thing. Psychological biases uh, have been studied very extensively. You can think of them as the difference between sort of reflexive cognitive actions and deliberate reasoning. Uh, the way it's been recently characterized uh, by uh, Daniel uh, uh, Kahneman is as sort of system one, system two, fast thinking, slow thinking, which um, from your nods I see that some of you are aware of those ideas. There's a small industry, maybe a large industry out there of uh, psychologists looking for cognitive biases. I would say that it's a pretty good summary of cognitive biases, even though it is Wikipedia and that normally uh, I would say to students uh, be extremely cautious. From a perspective of processing information, what kinds of things might interfere with uh, rational decision, decision making, good decision making? One aspect is uh, memory. Our memory is really not set up well for making abstract rational decisions, but for our hunter-gatherer origins. And we're fighting against that uh, all the time. To summarize information to help us adapt and survive is a function that we do all the time. And there's a tendency for us then to generalize too much and to generalize everything that we see. So take one or two examples, make it general, and believe that it's a law without thoroughly having tested it. It's another possibility that um, uh, if there's uh, too much information, we might just focus on uh, certain details, especially if they are um, uh, particularly salient. If, you, if we have to um, act fast, what we might do is rather than consider all of the options, how do you in that decision, make, uh, how in that case do you make a decision when you have to act fast? Well, probably you will favor something which is familiar to you. Or if there could be a, a situation where there's too little meaning. Okay? And in this case, it could be um, uh, we actually don't know what's in the mind of other people, but we often think we do yeah? in everyday life, but also in meetings. And how often do you actually explicitly, when somebody says something which is halfway ambiguous, stop and say, no, what did you really mean? Okay? Rather than assuming that it was negative or positive in a way that satisfies your own particular disposition. Okay? So in terms of psychological biases, what do the tools do? Well, maybe uh, the si uh, silence helps us think more rationally. Rather than making just a quick, intuitive reaction to uh, an idea, we'll actually try and think it through. And certainly the idea of having a pause so that your immediate emotional reaction to what can decline uh, and then there's space for you to think about it, may maybe that this is a good thing. The role of the clerk is also explicitly to try and think about all of the information. The training that the client will have had through experience may naturally mean that they don't just naturally react to oh, you know, what they've uh, just heard. And so this is similarly with the process of uh, discernment, to be open-minded. And if people bring that uh, to a meeting, it's possible uh, that uh, they will be more willing to uh, entertain uh, other ideas.
Similarly, uh, the corporate values, uh, again, uh, try to work against uh, these uh, psychological uh, uh, biases. Um, in terms of open-mindedness, it's uh, when you feel a resistance against an idea, that's when you should be most on your guard that there's a bias coming in. Okay? And if you are aware of this happening, you can see other people saying that uh, uh, I, I was first very much against this idea, but now that I've re reflected on it, it can then build the kind of culture that would allow ideas to flourish. So my favourite theory uh, from cognitive science is uh, problem-solving uh, as heuristic searching. It's a bit more technical and complex, but I think it is even more powerful than the idea of uh, biases. And the idea here is to actually formally define what a problem is and then to use that formal definition in order to then determine what is an effective problem solving and then what, for example, would be creative problem solving. A creative problem solving needs no mysterious process in order to explain it. You start off uh, uh, characterizing a problem as some kind of initial state where you are. You have no solution. Uh, and what's important is there should be some uh, solution criteria which you're going to satisfy in order to solve the problem. So this is the definition of a well-structured problem. Uh, there are states, ideas which you generate uh, as intermediate states, and there are operators, you know, particular inferences that you make, in order to generate further ideas. And notice here what we have is a branching tree. So there are lots of different, decision, uh, lots of different inferences that you may, can make from where you are with your initial state. Right? So part of the idea of problem solving is to find those paths that would get you to a solution. And there may be more than one solution that satisfies the criteria. So effective problem solving is really a matter of finding those paths which are relatively short and actually manage to get you to a solution rather than all of these unprofitable paths. Effective problem solving is also sufficiently sampling uh, the whole tree to know that you know, your solution is at least decent um, to try and uh, satisfy in terms of exploring enough so that uh, you satisfy the cr uh, criteria, but you don't do an exhaustive search of all the possibilities because there's no time uh, to do that. So how do, would we explain uh, creative problem solving? Well, creative uh, problems are all often ones where there is no initial state but often, you don't know what kinds of inferences or what kind of information you need. And also, you often don't know uh, what kinds of conditions you have in order to satisfy the, the problem. Uh, creative problem solving is actually to generate a new problem in which your problem pops up a different level. And it's the uh, problem of finding the criteria for the solution. Actually, go to a different space where you actually think of different moves that you can make within the well-structured space. Okay. And so the studies that uh, cognitive scientists have done is actually shown this dance amongst different spaces. And even the process of scientific discovery, you can classify in terms of a search of a space of theories and a search of a space of possible ex uh, experimental results. And then you combine the two, and they mutually constrain each other. So what are mysterious, is, mysterious processes, apparently, can actually be explained quite rationally. So the clerk has a, an enviable task of uh, trying to keep tabs of all of the different avenues that have been searched in the uh, problem space. Okay? And if the clerk themselves fixates too much on just one path or closes down uh, uh, contributions too early, the whole space may not be uh, thoroughly uh, uh, explored. But then again, uh, the clerk is trying to get some sense of what the overall space is in a way that not everybody else is trying to do. And so maybe then picking out the one or two paths, which are the best paths amongst all of those that have been explored, is what the role of the clerk is meant to be about. Having different kinds of minutes which you're going to write. So being clear up front, do you need a decision or do you just need to explore the idea and not make a decision? Um, is uh, one possibility uh, not to have fruitless conversations because you have a clear goal. Allow, having the silence allows perhaps different parts of the uh, tree to be searched because you could restart from somewhere, somewhere else rather than carrying on digging deeper and deeper. Okay? So a silence and a break allowed you perhaps to reset and backtrack to somewhere earlier. The idea of open-mindedness uh, can promote wider search. Given the amount of time, I'm not going to try and talk about each one of these links. Okay. Uh, the third uh, aspect which I'll talk about is sociodynamics. 
right? and there's been a lot on this. Uh, work, for example, by Milgram in his famous experiments on uh, electric shocks, uh, the notion of groupthink, uh, lots of work on don't do brainstorming, it's not a good way of generating ideas. Right? So if anybody uh, really likes doing running groups that does brainstorming, there's much better ways to do it. One experiment uh, carried out by Ash, uh, what are the circumstances do you get conformity in a group? Right? So imagine you're in a meeting, and this meeting has the really arduous task of deciding which of these three sticks is the longest. You are the last person, and you've been set up, as, and all the Confederates have been primed to say, ah, it's C, it's C, it's C. Are looking at them thinking, what, is their eyesight terrible? And so the great temptation is also just to say C, to go along with the crowd. Here is a participant, you know, they broke into a sweat because there's so much tension between the social environment versus the cognitive environment where then discounting their own uh, eyesight. Maybe I've not understood the rules properly. The answer is really C, but I'm not smart enough uh, to know what the answer is. A participant says C, and the, the, this is a, um, a picture from the original one, and if I could zoom in this poor uh, character, the stress on his face is uh, really quite uh, intense. Right? You can easily break this phenomena by, uh, if you have fewer confederates, uh, but if you have just one other person who says, no, actually, I think it's B. Uh, you would say B if one other person said B. Okay, it's enough. Right? And so this is the basis of the um, group, group think. Uh, take these ideas about social dynamics and look at the mappings, exploring new ideas, being uh, open-mindedness uh, open uh, works towards an account of these social dynamics. Okay? Uh, the idea of also discernment as well uh, can counter some of these uh, social pressures of which are... Let me summarise. So, uh, in terms of memory, psychological biases, uh, social dynamics, for each one of these tools, what we can do is say whether it um, mitigates it or it doesn't. And so this is my own personal interpretation. There's no empirical evaluation here. This is just my observations uh, uh, and also what it says in uh, faith and practice. And by all means, play this game for yourself. I don't know, if you have a look and see you know, how would you fill in this matrix and certainly for me uh, and I could be biased here because um, I've sat in many meetings and maybe I've been socially influenced by being amongst many of the Quakers in those meetings but uh, the majority of these uh, 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 potential problems may well be mitigated by one or more of these tools so that's my scientific analysis of why the a business method might work.